Well, not sure it gets any prettier than that. George Winston's Thanksgiving, a uh, simple uh, piece of music. Its uh, foundation is built on a circle of fifths. Modulations will go through this. Uh, sort of like the quintessential classic New Age piano piece. Uh, I mean, it's just absolutely gorgeous, is it not? So, anyways, um, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, we have student lessons, or excuse me, student questions to take care of today. I hope you guys are all cozy with your families and um, chilling out, having a good time, and um, we'll see if we can entertain you a little bit here today. I think that uh, the first thing uh, we'll start with is... What I'm thankful for. All right, so here's what I'm thankful for. Uh, the first thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, boom. Well, I'm thankful for having um, Kimberly today, Miranda with the Star Wars cupcakes and joining us. Hi, Miranda. Uh, dinner for me? I don't know. I don't know. Later. I'll go somewhere, I guess. Danny, hi. Dave, good to have you here. Joe, and all these fantastic people. Let's see here. Can't really do that. Okay. All right. Um, well, what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for my freedom to live in the greatest country in the world where I can do this, where we can sing, and I can have an opinion, I can teach, and have opportunities. <clears throat> I'm thankful that my son has. Uh, uh, who I don't get an opportunity to live with, he doesn't live with me, he's in Florida, is um, being taken care of. He's got a good mother. I'm thankful for that a lot. Uh, going down the line, I'm thankful for you guys. I'm thankful for my students. Um, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to have met so many of you through the years and to uh, touch your lives in some way, form or fashion. That's a wonderful privilege and a great opportunity. I'm thankful for that opportunity. Um, honorable mentions in the last year or so, I'm thankful for certain partnerships that are helping me to bring TBS and our training to more people around the world. Um, my growing team, Draven Gray, Sam Picadenti, Jonathan Arjuno, Mike Elson, Jay-Z Microphones, to some extent, Rode Microphones. Who else? There's others, and I apologize if I haven't, um, if I forget your name, but don't want to get too sappy, but that's what I'm thankful for. So let's get on with helping you guys out. The first question we have here is from Frankie. Frankie's question is, does, let's get that thing, where is it? It's right here. The big book. Frankie's question is, 
Does your book, does your book and course include tongue lessons, lectures on where to put the tongue and all of this? Um, the answer to that is, yeah, it does. Um, there are uh, elements in the book and lectures that talk about tongue positions. There are three tongue positions for singing. Tip of the tongue, back of the bottom teeth, you take the tip of the tongue and press it against the back of the bottom teeth. It creates sympathetic contractions that make the larynx dampen, gives you good stability. That's number one. There's the uh, open throat tongue position, which just looks sort of like this. Okay, and you bring the tongue out, has the benefit of bringing the back of the tongue forward, increasing space in the, in the pharyngeal area, and that helps you with oh, all kinds of things, really. I use it when I'm screaming. I do like rock scream stuff. I, I'll put my tongue forward because I want a little bit more space in the, in the pharynx. And three, uh, similar to the tongue leveraging position is... Uh, a tongue a position, we take the tip of the tongue and you leverage it below the, the uh, below the roots of the bottom teeth or the ventricular vestibule, something like that. We talked about it last week. Okay, so you put the tongue here. Okay. All right. We have two tongue leveraging positions, one here underneath the roots of the bottom teeth. One against the, directly against the bottom teeth, and then the open throat position. All of these tongue positions are positions that you'll use when you sing through vowels. All right. uh, the tongue needs to go to work to articulate the pops and clips of most of the consonants. Uh, so these are, in some sense, the tongue positions are vowel positions. Great. Next question from Dan. Hey, Robert, I'm doing the TBS um, on another platform, and I really like the class, but I have a question about it. How it's worth to go with the onsets and with the practicing? I mean, do every day the track and track and release and learn new onsets every door, every day, or what do you recommend for students? All right, so teachers pay attention. It's just basically you have to reinterpret these questions. The question in the question is essentially, what do I do? I'm in the program. I enjoy it. I like it. I'm looking at, he's referring to some of the warm-ups in here, track and track, track and release, release and sustain. Okay. And... Uh, I think I need more light. Hopefully that'll help. Uh, yeah, that's a little nicer. Um, where do you start? Okay, look, go out to the... Goodness gracious. Go out to the training page of the course and dive into module one and module two and module three. Okay, module one is the warm-ups. All right, go out there, watch the videos. Every single workout has a video of me demonstrating how to do it. I explain how to do it as an introduction where I'm explaining it, and then there's a video of me doing it. So if you're totally lost, what do you do? You fire up the video and you just train over the video, okay? And if that's not clear enough for you, you can go to the lessons in the course where there's a, a laid out lesson that tells you exactly everything you need to do. All right? And it's also explained in the book. All right? So start with your warm ups. You don't get a pass on not doing the warm ups. Module one track and track, track and release, release and sustain is something you're going to continue to do um, all the time as a beginner or even if you've been doing it for 30 years like myself. All right? You know, that's that's just that just goes into the territory. You, you gotta do your warm-ups. Then you're gonna train the onsets. Go to module two and start learning the onsets. Spend maybe a week or a few days on each onset 
And what you do is you're just going to train each onset one note at a time. Starting low. Okay, for men, maybe a low G. For women, maybe a low B. Okay. And you just do one onset at a time. Me. guys uh, that are in the program, um, that's just one of the eight onsets that you can train. It's probably the first one that most of us learn. It's called track and release, where I'm tracking through a nasal and releasing into an amplified bow. All right, so uh, practice. And there's, again, videos of me doing each one of them. All right, um, and then once you have, you're warmed up and you understand the onsets, then what you do is you build integrated training routines. We take the onsets and we plug the onsets into sirens or other workouts. Typically, we start with sirens, but there's 32 workouts in the program that you can plug the onsets into. Every workout needs an onset, okay? So get to know the onsets, train them, learn their features, their advantages, their benefits, everything that's great about it, Then, then and use that to sort of do the detail work. Make every single onset perfect, all right? Then you plug it into, you plug the onset into, um, into the, gosh, I know why my, hang on here, what's that? Hang on guys, I'm just checking my, my video real quick. Train your onsets, okay, and then plug them into vowels, so we do integrated training routines, all okay? right? So here at the Vocalist Studio, we don't just sort of do workouts. Uh, one thing that I've done that my teachers do that we do that's unique is we understand the anatomy of a workout okay and the anatomy of a workout has three elements to it number one an onset how you start and you get kind of sort of smart about that number two vowels what vowel or resonance or formance you're working with and tuning with all right and three the facilities the workouts the scales mp3 files that, that you plug them into okay so I know it got like way off on a big tangent there. So getting back to Dan's question. Dan, what do you do? <sighs> Always warm up to make a commitment to learning all of the onsets. Maybe every two days change a different one or dedicate one week to each onset. The five onsets I want you to train and study uh, first and foremost is the track and release onset the pulse and release onset, or the cry mode onset, the wind and release onset, the dampen and release onset, which is a belting onset for the head voice, and the attack and release onset, glottal attacks, which is another belting in the head voice, uh, strength building onset. Those are the five most important everyday common onsets, all right? Um, and then you take those onsets and you plug them in the vowels, and we call them integrated training routines. The point is, is that teachers and students can build their own customized routines to address their own specific problems, okay? <clears throat> That's my advice. Warm up, learn the onsets, and start building routines and start training, okay? Um, and by the way, that's all explained. That's all explained in the program stuff. So if you're walk, if you're doing the, the lectures and you're reading the book and you're, 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 you're participating in the program, you'd know that. My easy button. My easy button. Okay, we have a question from somebody with a very exotic name. It is Nithyashri. 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 Very exotic. Is that Indian? I don't know. But anyways, Nithyashri's question is: My internal nose is always blocked. Will this affect when I try to sing using my head voice, nasal voice? Also, is head voice and nasal voice one and the same? This is a good question. It's something that uh, voice coaches come across from time to time, um, but there's really two questions in here. One is in regards to, uh, uh, she says, well, when she sings, uh, she gets like nose blockage and stuff. That could actually be a septum issue. That could be uh, uh, something that you may want to have the doctor take a quick look at. There are people that can't breathe through their nose 
and it, it it's not a I don't think it's it's not a big deal. It doesn't prevent you from singing, but it can be just sort of a minor a minor annoyance, right? Your ability to breathe through your nose and and, and what have you. So that's one issue, but I don't want you to be alarmed by it. But you might have a doctor take a look at it. Maybe they can open you up a little bit. Two, the other question in here, which is really very common, and that is um, when I go to my head voice or my nasal voice, uh, uh, is nasal sounds and head voice sounds, are they the same? Okay. Uh, no, yeah, they're two different things. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. When students begin to train the content, they begin to train and they begin to get a little better. One of the first things that happens is the um, when they release into the vowels, they begin to hear amplified frequencies, right? Which is what we're going for. And oftentimes, as the voice gets healthier and more coordinated, those amplified frequencies are brighter. They tend to be a little bit, a little bit more pingy, more ringy, a little bit more brilliant in their, in their, in their, uh, in their frequencies. May. See, that has a lot of amplified, bright harmonics in it that are different than speech, as you can hear. It's got a lot of, um, okay, you know, to the right of the spectrograph, a lot of amplified clusters of brighter harmonics and overtones. I think you guys get it. And. Hearing these amplified, brighter harmonics in the voice for a beginner is a new thing. And, 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 and when you hear, the, you hear your voice and your body making new sound colors, it, um, until you get used to it and you get some feedback from a good coach that assures you that it's okay, it can create confusion. Right? Um, oh, gosh, I, I hear brighter harmonics. I hear new colors, which is what you want. That's a good thing, usually. But I'm new, I'm a beginner, I'm sort of naive. Yeah, I'm, you know, I don't know if that's right or not. Um, so that's sort, of the, that's sort of the environment that we're talking about when you get a question like this. And then the other thing that happens for some strange reason is that people are, are already somewhat familiar with a nasal sound, okay? This would be a nasal sound. Not real good at my nasal sounds, but. A nasal sound is very honky, very honky, okay? But a nasal sound color also has amplified brighter harmonics. So both the the singing vowel and the nasal sound color, which you wouldn't use for singing, you might use it in a character voice at Disney, but you wouldn't use it for singing. And um, they do have something in common. They both have amplified brighter harmonics. So the beginner naive student begins to release nice singing vowels, May! and they get confused, and they think, uh, 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 I think that's uh, nasal. That is that nasal? I, I think it's nasal. Is that nasal? And usually it's not. Usually it's not nasal. So the moral of the story is, as a beginner, when you begin to get healthy, and you begin to amplify your singing vowels be better, one of the symptoms of getting better and getting good at this is that your vowels will be a little brighter. It'll be like somebody turned up the treble knob. All right? And, you, and that's, a, that's what you want. You want that. And be really super careful not to confuse that sound color with nasality. All right? And I talk about this in the course in the book. All right? Uh, bright harmonics, bright, beautiful, amplified singing vowel harmonics is not nasality. Okay, if it's a sound color that you can imagine using in a song or hearing it in a song in your singing, and you can honestly say to yourself, "Yeah, uh, hey, 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 h
okay, I can, I can imagine hearing that vowel in a song, singing through that vowel, then, then, it's, then it's probably right, all right? But if you're, if you're really truly nasal, it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily sound that great, okay? So, so listen to the sound colors that you're creating and, and, and begin to practice being judgmental about, about the sound color. Practice going for some colors that you like and that you know are probably correct. And if it's really super nasally, it's different. Okay? Maybe I'll give you some A-B testing here. This is a good sound. This is a nasal sound. Again. Versus. Alright. The first one sounds good. We can imagine that that would be in singing in a song. Probably sound good. The second one doesn't sound good. That's how you know. All right. Now, uh, another thing that can create some confusion here is that the very the first warm up, the warm ups that I was referring to earlier in this broadcast, track and release, release and sustain, they're predicated on buzzing on nasals. <laughs> Okay, so we're buzzing on the con on nasal consonants, the, the pho phonetics of it, M, N, and N, G. They happen to have a name. They're called nasals, and yes, they sort of involve the nose a little bit, I suppose, but don't confuse that with when you then release to the vowel. Mm -hmm. All right, I was buzzing on the nasal consonant, but when I released my vowel, it wasn't nasal. Okay, so that's another thing that can get people, beginners, down the path into this confusion, all right, uh, is that because they're buzzing on nasals, they sort of conclude, oh, then well, I'm releasing a nasal sound. No, you're not. You're not. You're releasing a nasal sound when it sounds ugly and sounds nasal, but if you release it and it's not nasal and it's sort of a nice amplified color that you haven't heard before, but it's kind of, you can imagine it in a song, it's not nasal. That's it. That's all I'm going to do. That was easy. Actually, I'm not sure that was all that easy, but we got it. All right, um, another question here. How do I know if I'm practicing the warm-ups in the right way? Also, I'm not clear with the idea of chest voice and head voice. Please explain. Thank you. Uh, Nithyashri, same student from India, asks, how do I know if I'm practicing the warm-ups the right way? Um, I think I just gave you a big example of that. Listen to the sound color. If it's something you can imagine inside, your, inside a song, if you can imagine you taking that sort of that that sound color moment and dropping it into a song and you can imagine that it would sound good and you're you like it then it's probably okay all right um and uh if it's not then you know maybe maybe it's nasally maybe it's grindy maybe it's really throaty and dopey okay then it then it's not okay you've got to train yourself to listen singing is an instrument we're dealing and working and playing and singing in a world of acoustics this is the this is an acoustic endeavor so you've got to start listening diligently and critically to yourself and analyze those colors now you might ask as a beginner well how do i know okay i get that i can listen to it i can sort of try to be critical but i don't have the experience how do i know all right you know, you compare it to the sounds that you hear from other professional singers. Compare it to the sounds that you hear from the demonstration videos that I gave you. All right? That's one really great way to do it. And then just be honest with yourself. Do I like it? Do I not? That's, that's really can take you down the right path. Um, because, if, because if it's not good, it's sort of obvious. So even for beginners, it's sort of obvious. And if it's good, does sound good, or... It at least better, it's also sort of obvious. It's not It's not a mystery. All right, the other question is, uh, I'm not clear with the ideas of chest voice and head voice. Okay, chest voice and head voice, I got news for you guys. Chest voice and head voice, It's these are just imagery words. They're just picture words that, that, that have sort of 
that, that describe the feeling that we have in the lower register. It's where the speaking voice resides. It's the register that's very intuitive. It's the one that sort of responds well for us when we're training and singing. And yay, yay! head voice is the higher stuff, okay, that tends to be more difficult. Uh, initially, it starts with falsetto, but through the training and this program, you build the musculature and you begin to not have it sound like falsetto. You don't want it to. You begin to build the strength and the motor skills and the things we're talking about in the course and in the book, all right, to help you sound big and boomy in the head voice, okay? Um, so chest voice down here. Um, it's where you speak, it's very intuitive, it's where things seem to be sort of easy. Head voice is everything above where things start getting choky, pushy, falsetto-y, we're getting in problems, okay? And in some sense, the mission statement for the studio, the main, in some sense, sort of the purpose of the big book that I wrote and the big course and everything that's going on is to be able to bridge the registers, chest voice and head voice, to be able to sing seamlessly from the chest voice to the head voice and create the illusion of one voice. And really at some point in your training, as you get more and more experience in regards to the musculature and the motor skills, it really does become one voice. It's not even illusion anymore. All right. So at first, a beginner, it's very, oh God, I'm in my chest voice and oh, now I'm in my head voice because I know because it's all set out and I'm breaking. That's sort of where beginners start. And then the next step is sort of you know, I'm in my chest voice and I'm bridging into my head voice, but I've got a little bit of connectivity. Right, it's got a little bit of compression on top. It's not falsetto. So you remove falsetto, but you got a lot more work to do. And then, and then, and then, as far as step three is that you begin to build the musculature enough, enough strength in the musculature and enough elongation with, uh, through cry mode and other elements that you need to take the physiology higher, literally. And at that point, <laughs> you're actually taking your chest voice, the, the physiology higher, okay? So we start with a lot, a lot of break, and then we get sort of a nice registration going, but it might be sort of light and it needs more musculature development. Step three is to get more advanced you really begin to just stretch that musculature higher, okay? So that's chest voice, head voice, but you know, an important lesson with this is realize that chest voice, head voice are not real things. They're just sort of chest voice, head voice. These terms are just picture words that we use. It's become pretty ubiquitous in the industry that we use to describe this lower register that's developed in this upper register that needs training, okay? Um, that's what it means. And uh, again, uh, that's in the book, in the course. All right. That was easy. So we expect India to be singing better. All right, I got a few more questions here and 15 minutes. Let me just check in on, on, our, on our folks here. Kimberly. Kat, Walton, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, buddy. Elena. And the second question is, when you finish, you get a diploma and more details about it, if it's possible. Yes. Um, Elena, when you finish the three courses that I now have on Udemy, you get this cool little diploma or this little certificate. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, you have to go through all the lessons, though. Um, by the way, update, there's now three TVS courses. There's really those four, all right? Um, there's, the, there's the light version of the full course that's on my website. That's sort of the real deal course that has everything in it. But there's a light version of that out at Udemy. And at Udemy, um, about a couple months ago, I released a vocal warm-up course, which, which goes in deep and explores the entire universe of warming up. It's not just, well, here's your files and do some lip trills and good luck. That's not the kind of thing that I would put together. There is a lot of discussion in there on, on different kinds of famous warm-ups that are used in good studios around the world, different, like the top four kind ways to warm up. Um, 
what warm-ups actually do, how they actually help you, what they're doing to help, so you're sort of knowledgeable about that. Um, then there is, of course, lessons that teach you how to do certain warm-ups, and I recommend one that is that is uh, my favorite and the thing that we do here in, in our studio. Um, so there's a vocal warm-ups, so your complete vocal warm-up program course at Udemy. There's the much larger light version of my full course called Become a Great Singer, your complete vocal training system. And uh, about three days ago, I released the third Udemy course, and it's called Vocal Masterclass, uh, Robert Lunty Live. So what we did is we took all the content and video footage that we picked up this last spring when we were on tour with um, our certified instructors and road microphones. We went to Germany, Italy, France, and then came back here to Seattle and did a one-week master class in Seattle. And we took all that footage and we edited it into like little learning moments, little learning and coaching moments. It's super cool. Uh, go out to um, Udemy, check it out. Vocal Masterclass, Robert Lunty Live. A lot of fun. You know, it's sort of cool because it's it's improv and sort of gritty and it's there's no lavaliers, there's no scripts, there's no uh, uh, teleprompter, there's no preparation. It's just me live in front of uh, students and teachers on the road this last spring. Those are the three courses at Udemy. And then, of course, over at the Vocalist Studio is the main full course. Um, so... Elena, on all of them, you get a little certificate when you when you complete it. Yes. All right, Karina Chan, what kind of exercises are good to achieve the clean sound? Uh, uh, Karina, the kinds of workouts that are good to produce a clean sound are every workout. Uh, uh, um, whether you're producing a clean sound or not, the exception of the exception would be very specific vocal distortion techniques and workouts. Other than the very specific vocal distortion workouts that are used to build anything other than clean, let's put those aside, okay, non-clean sounds, everything else is clean. Right? So, so whether you're clean or not really isn't dependent upon the workout, that's just how you're executing your workouts and what you want to do with your voice. The exception being, again, specific vocal distortion effect workouts. Which, by the way, there's three of them in my course that are available to you guys that you want to do distortion. And uh, um, my buddy, Draven Gray, and I have released a new vocal distortion course as well, which you can also find out, find out at Udemy. So um, I have some content I've contributed. I was invited by Draven to contribute some content to that vocal distortion course. It's the world's best vocal distortion course on the planet today. Um, Draven did most of the work. It's really his course. I have about eight videos in there sharing my vocal distortion techniques. It's really fantastic. It's out of Udemy. So actually, when I include the partnership, the collaborative distortion course with, with Draven, there's really four. That's four Udemy workouts uh, uh, courses that are available to you guys if you want to continue to expand your your uh, TBS experience and the full course. All right. And good pitch. Uh, uh, hello from Belgium. Marlene. Hello, Belgium. Belgium. I've been through Belgium. I've been in your beautiful new airport. You guys got a really gorgeous airport. Um, but I've not done a master class in Belgium yet. So if you're a voice coach, Marlene, if you're a voice coach, send me an email. Let's work on doing something in Brussels. I'd really love to do that. Um, we'll bring our microphone sponsors and partners with us and have a good time. Um, we'd love to take these vocal techniques to Belgium and um, get like a, you know, get like a special Belgium hat. And, and <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'd love to come. Give me an invite, please. <laughs> All right, um, Karina, interesting. Yes. Okay. So we have 10 minutes, 10 minutes, here we go. From Paul, Paul asks, I am a student from Germany using your online training programs for seniors. I'm still a beginner 
learning how to do it. Um, but I've got a question concerning the head voice. All right. And the question is, why do singers tend to rise in volume when they move into the head voice? Why do singers rise in volume when they move to the head voice? That's a very interesting question. I don't really have a problem with going louder, but it seems to me that pro singers, professional singers, can go to their head voice without having to go up in volume. Yeah, that's true. Um, let's not call it pro, just people with experience and skills. So my actual question for training is, Paul Gray from Germany, should I, as a more or less beginner, try to go up in volume? Should I increase my volume? Because it might be simple to get to the head voice this way. Or should I try to stay on one volume level while learning to bridge to the head voice? I hope you understand. I do, because I've been doing this for many, many years. But I will, I will uh, translate that question. Um, voice coaches, notice what's happening here. It's an important skill that I want to help you guys with. Uh, because students don't all know the talk track, the technique, and the things, and they're they're students. They don't, they, you know, they're they're learning. They're they're beginners. They they're, they're learning all of this. You, you need to be able to take a question and literally sort of unpack the question and find the question inside. Okay, and then re-translate it in a way that makes more sense. And you want to do that with your students. So you get something like, like, why do singers tend to rise in volume when they move high into the head voice? I don't think I can do that, but should I? Should I rise in volume as I go to the head voice? That I, I, I feel like that's what I hear. I'm Paul from Germany. Um, and from my perspective as a coach, I'm listening to this question, and it's sort of got elements of nonsense to it. Because, but that's not Paul's fault. It's just that Paul doesn't really, you know, he's a beginner. He doesn't understand what's going on. So, so um, I'm going to reinterpret this question to really simply mean here's what here's what Paul's really trying to say. Paul's trying to say when I try to train when I bridge from the chest voice through my passaggio into my head voice, there's an element of elegance and sort of lightness to it, which would, which would probably be expected if you're a beginner and you're not wanting to push, okay? But when I listen to professionals and famous singers that have the strength and motor skills developed, it sounds like they're the, or Robert, when I listen to you do it, <laughs> You know, it sounds big. It sounds like you're increasing your volume. All right. So, so as a beginning student, is that something I should do? Should I try to increase my volume as I'm working on my bridging and connecting skills? Um, an interesting question. And um, and I would say no, don't, don't. The the first of all, let's just make sure that we're clear on the fact that this is not this is not um, a the volume isn't increasing. It's not like I'm stepping up to the volume knob on my ghetto blaster or on my, on my PA system and turning up the volume. That's not what's happening. It's important to, to get a good answer on this and get a good understanding. It's important that we're, that we're clear on the difference between volume and amplification. It's not the same thing. Volume is is just turning the knob up and getting louder, and that's not what I want you to do. In singing, volume would be sort of be sort of like I'm going to push, I'm going to blow harder, I'm going to constrict harder, I'm going to squeeze harder on the glottis, and that those things can create more volume. All right, but that's not why. That's not what I want you to do. That's why I don't want Paul to. Be training with the with this idea that I'm going to add that he's going to add more volume because if he's thinking I'm going to add more volume as I 
work on my bridging and connecting skills, what that will what that will translate to is he'll start pushing, he'll start squeezing, he'll start he'll unpack a whole bunch of new problems that he probably didn't have before, but now he's got these other problems because he's trying to add volume as he's doing this delicate finesse maneuver of bridging chest voice to head voice and trying to sound big and boomy in the head voice. All right? So no, don't increase your volume, Paul, from Germany, which by the way, Germany, I love Germany. It's just a wonderful country. Um, I love going there. Uh, so what do you do? I want you to change your mental imagery from from in anything you do. It could be your Reaching to the head voice, singing the head voice. It could be singing something easy in your chest voice. All of it. All of you guys, not just Paul. Stop thinking about adding volume and getting louder. Don't do that because that, that unpacks a bunch of problems, of physical problems. What I want you to do is be thinking about amplifying formants. Don't get louder. Amplify your vowels. Amplify your resonance. Balance and amplify your formats on every single note that you're working on. on, on, on from the simplest warm-up to something complex, a big, aggressive, heroic, bridging maneuver. Be thinking about amplifying yourself. Now, as you amplify your, the harmonics, you amplify the, the format, as you amplify your resonance, you might get a little louder, but that's okay. If getting a little bit louder is a symptom of, of amplifying, thinking about amplifying your vowels and your form, it's better, then that's good. And in fact, that is in fact what happens. You want a little more volume, don't think about turning up the volume. Think about balancing and amplifying your form and your vowels better. Think about how you're controlling and amplifying the resonance, the resonance that you're producing when you release into vowels. All right. So, for example, um, this is me trying to add volume. All right. Now. That might be sort of fun or funny or whatever, and I could even imagine that distortion working for a, maybe a brief, brief moment in a performance or something, perhaps. But in training, you would never want to do that because you also saw my voice broke. There was pushing, there was squeezing. There was a, it was a mess. It was just a, a, a flipping mess. All right. Now this is more or less the same movement, but I'm not thinking about adding volume, which takes me down a path of pushing and squeezing it's a tar baby what i'm thinking about more really is and in some sense it's been sort of the thing today i'm going to listen to my sound color make sure i'm not nasal make sure it's a lovely color and all i want to do is amplify all i want to do is balance the energy okay will i get a little a little more volume out of that probably probably but that's not what i'm going for I, what I'm going for is a beautiful color and a nice balanced amplified resonance. Alright. I'm not thinking when I did that, I'm not thinking get louder. I'm thinking I'm thinking balance the resonance, amplify the resonance. Now, the other important point about volume versus amplifying is most singers, even classical singers, they're using these. Okay, this is this is a tool that singers use. It's called a microphone. All right, and it's designed to amplify your voice. So this is another really important, obvious reason not to be thinking, I got to get louder, I got to shout, I got to get louder. Why? Why? You're going to mess up the balance of your resonance, you're going to start pushing, and you don't need to anyways because you have a microphone in your hand. All right? And if you don't have a microphone, most people do, but if you don't have a microphone in your hand, then you're, you're in the bathroom, you're in a concert hall, you're, you're, in, you're in a stairwell, you're in a space that, that, that has ambience in it, and it sort of amplifies itself, just the resonance in the space. Okay? 
that's another way of getting amplified. All right. So I hope that answers your question, Paul. And um, by the way, it's great to have you as a student. And I've uh, done so many master classes in Germany, I can't even remember uh, how many, maybe 10 or 12. Um, this last uh, spring, we were in Ansbach. Ansbach. Um, I believe that's in Bavaria, um, uh, sort of near Nuremberg. I've got a lot of really wonderful friends in Germany um, and uh, teachers in Germany as well. So anyways, um, that's a good enough point, but that's it. Stop trying to get louder and start trying to amplify and balance your performance. Okay? So. That was easy. Cool. Paul, thank you for a very interesting question. These are all great questions. Um, that is an hour. I'm going to let you guys go. And I'm going to stay here and add some, some comments with you guys. And I'm going to give you a special deal. We have, uh, we have a Crazy Larry, Freaky Friday, Black Friday deal for you guys, OK? Crazy Larry, Freaky Friday deal, all right? I'm going to put it in the link here for you guys, all right? Basically, I'm offering the full course the full course, not the, the light and the sort of the stripped down lean stuff over at Udemy, but the full course off my website um, to you guys for a special deal. So, so stay tight. I'm going to drop a link in here when we're done. And I want to thank you all for coming. We'll be here next Thursday as well. And um, remember this, the proof in the singing is in the singing, but the proof in the teaching is in the teaching. All right, so with that, I love you guys, and uh, have a great, happy Thanksgiving.